thanks everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. You uh, have loved our next guests in shows like Lost and Arrow, The Night Of, movies like The Big Lebowski, Barton Fink, Oh Brother Where Art Thou, and now you can see John Turturro and Michael Emerson in a new eight-part adaptation of Umberto Eco's classic novel, The Name of the Rose, which follows a Franciscan friar and his apprentice as they investigate a mysterious death at a Benedictine monastery in 1327. Everybody, please welcome the great John Turturro and Michael Emerson. Let's hear it. Uh, guys, thank you so much for being here. Congratulations on this project. I imagine a massive undertaking, both of you moving to Italy for the length of the shoot. Is that correct? We were over there quite a lot. I, I had some time off where I could come home and you know resume my real life. But uh, it was a kind of an immersion. It was a good long time to Did spend. Did it feel like home. a vacation from your real life while also working? Every good role seems like a kind of vacation or escape <laughs> from your real life yeah. Yeah. in a dangerous way sometimes. Right. Yeah. What has been the most, the, mo the most dangerous role for you? Well, this was a, this was a good one. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes you don't know that a role has crept up on you and maybe taken you over a little bit and, until you put it down and walk away from it. And then you think, oh my gosh, I kind of lost track of myself for a little while there. Someone in your personal life is like, hey, you're being weird. And you're like, oh yeah, whoa, I gotta shake this thing that's going on with me. Yeah. Um, how, familiar, how familiar were the two of you with um, the, the, the original novel, the classic novel? I, I didn't know, uh, I hadn't read the book when I first received the, uh, the first few episodes. And then once I read the book, I liked the book better than the scripts. And so I spoke to the director, I said, listen, if, if I'm going to go forward in, in this endeavor, I would love to, to have more of Umberto Eco's voice. And so I sort of sent him some ideas, and then he said, I, I agree with you, and would you like to you know, work with me on the revision? And I wound up spending about six months uh, basically putting more of the book back into the scripts with the Giacomo Battiato. So I was involved for a long time, and I really fell in love with the book uh, because I think it has so many relevant uh, issues uh, that are alive today within this murder mystery, you know, it, it, because so much of the story deals with uh, the fear of knowledge and how knowledge is your only form of resistance against any form of absolutism. And, uh, you know, it, it just, it deals with this in a, in a really beautiful way. Because in all these dictatorships throughout the years, the first thing they do is ban the books, burn the books, and... Or tell you that intellectualism is bad or books are bad, right? right? And so in America, you can't burn books yet, but yeah, you can say... But, but, smart is but there's a ba there's a battle between you know knowledge and uh, and <laughs> and just accepting and this is about you know questioning and also dealing with how you can be a person of faith but also be a person of science, which is really an interesting how they can coexist or or or, or be in opposition to each other. Right in the states, we've kind of come to this weird cultural place where they are diametrically opposed. Yet there are so many members of the faith in this country who are people who love science and believe in different things than what we normally hear about when it comes right. to members of the faith. What was it like for you that moment when you decided you were going to be as heavily involved in the project as, uh, as you were? How did that, how did that really just, happen? It just sort of happened little by little. And I just, you know, you go on faith sometimes. I, I've been involved in things for, you know, a long periods of time and that haven't come to fruition. And, but it looked like it was going to be done. And then once I saw enough of it, I just thought Echo's voice was so particular that I didn't want to have it watered down, and I've done a lot of adaptations of novels for two hours, and it, it's you know quite truncated. And so his voice, he's a, he understood this subject matter. He taught this subject matter, and then he put it within this thriller sort of structure, and uh, it was a real pleasure to, uh, to have an encounter you know, a lot of those words that Michael is saying and I'm saying is their their echoes words. When you have a, a, a scene like that and, and and John, you're pretty much in most scenes of, 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 of the show from what I've seen. You're in a lot of it. Um what is it I mean if you have 
worked with the director on crafting the episodes and putting Echo's voice back in it. You are also a director yourself. Do you know how to turn your director hat yeah, off when you're in yeah. those scenes? Well, I've been working with the other actors. Yeah, actor. I'm wondering. With, and then yeah. Michael's an actor. You know, he's, was like that, that scene's like a, like a chess match. A yeah. lot of their relationship is... Um, a scene like that is when you know that you're happy to be an actor, that you have arrived in the big leagues where the playing is deep and sly and interesting and that there's a crackle to it. There's that abstract discussion about what he can or cannot do around the Abbey that is fraught with subtext, dangers, parries. You know, it's, it's really good that way. And that's when, when, when a pair of actors are firing on all cylinders like that, it, the day goes by so quickly and you're so happy. So many of your scenes early in the series are have that subtext or question of whether or not this person has something up their sleeve, how much, how much more they know than they're letting on, and what do they actually want the friar to investigate and find out because they, they know that there might be something at the end of that investigation that might hurt them. How do, you, how do you go into those scenes? How do you know what to give away and what not to give away in your performance? Well, you don't give much away. You just Fair. Play, it, you play it close to the best. Because the, the best thing in entertainment, I think, is mystery. I'm, I'm, I'm drawn to roles that are ambiguous or mysterious, where things are unsaid, but, are, but you know they're being calculated. Yeah. I, I just like, I, I like subtextuality in the playing. And you don't, so you give a little less, and it draws the audience in a little more. Right. I, I, I think that's very really apt, because people don't say what they mean. <laughs> they just don't. In real life, you know, people are, they're all playing parts, because we all have jobs to do, and there's, you know, you, you want to help the other person, but you also want to hold on to your job. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, well, anytime and, somebody says what they mean, it's like whoa. everything stops in the room. Yeah. Yeah. It's really shocking. You know, so people don't say what they mean. <laughs> uh, I wonder, is it that, is it, do you find on film sets it's that way as well? Or do people end up saying what they mean a little bit more because you're so you have so little time to get the thing done that you have to get done. So at least in a work environment, people have to be like, no, that's not what I want. I want this. And they have to kind of, they can't, um, they can't hide what they, have, what they mean a little as much. Uh, are you saying don't, don't we have to be somehow plain and forthright in, yeah. in our performance or the story doesn't get told? Yeah. Well, of course, you take care of, you, you, you take care of narrative first, but you do it in such a way that, it leaves questions. And then, I mean, also just working on a film set. And the time well, you can say, that, well, that doesn't seem to, I need to do that again. That, that doesn't seem to work. Well, that didn't really land. Oh, yeah. And you know when there's rhythm and you're working together, you know, one person can help the other person. The other, the other person can really help make your performance. Uh, so personally, sometimes you'll, you'll say, you know, well, I... I that I, I need to do that again. Or I, I'm very unhappy with that. Yeah. When you guys go into a scene like that, that we just saw, which like you said, is a chess match, how much, when you get on the set, how much do you find that you end up changing or playing with because you know maybe something doesn't feel exactly right and you know how the scene should be, but you're not getting there right away? Do you ever feel like you have to do that? Or did you not have to do that I, at all I, with I this? think every little move in that scene, if Michael moves or I move, I walk away, it, it, every, it counts. It's very, very critical. Th that's, that's where the, uh, you, you, your duty is to be a good listener also. Mm -hmm. So in, a, in take number four, John may try to make light of something in a slight way that he hadn't done before. My job is to react to that either to like or dislike or go along with it or right. be outraged, Some, something. I mean, you're, you're always tweaking, always tweaking. And, and if you're playing right, you know, you're finding the scene fresh ev every take, and every take will be different. It will have a different set of shadings, right. nuances. I mean, that's the hardest thing is to put your attention on the other person. Uh, and if you've done enough work, you can kind of let everything you've thought go and then, and then respond, you know, from your point of view, uh, and 
when that happens, it's it's really really nice. Is that? Do you think that's one of the biggest misunderstanding about actors is that they are vain or focused on themselves when in actuality a good actor or someone who cares about acting is much more focused on helping the other person that they're working with, their, you know, quote-unquote scene partner? Well, I suppose there's two schools of acting. Right. The, the one I like best and that I hope I belong to is the set of actors who try to get the hell out of the way right. and let the voice of the writer and the vision of the director take center stage. What's the other school? The other school is extroverted acting, which is a, a little more self-involved, a little showier, maybe. Right. I think, you know, if you like other people, <laughs> yeah, it, it, some people do and some people don't. <laughs> uh, uh, that, that, that's a big, that's helpful. It's, it's helpful, you know, and uh, you can really, uh, it, it's the space that happens between the two people, that's the most interesting thing. It's not separate, you know, it's what, what occurs here. Right. And that, you know, sometimes they try to put it together through editing, but if you actually do have that in the scene, it's, it makes it much easier to put it together. Then you, then you're, uh, then you have the, the luxury of not having to cut so much. That's right. To, to sort of piece together something that might not have actually existed in the take. Have either of you had an instance uh, over the course of your career, and don't feel like you have to name the movie or anything, where on set you felt like you really had that thing between you and the other actor that you're talking about, and then you saw the movie and it was cut in a way where that thing that you felt was there was lost? Well, I think we've all been the victim of bad editing. Yeah. For, for a, and that can happen for a number of technical reasons. That's like, right. oh, the best, the best take there was a fire engine in the background that we couldn't even hear. <laughs> but the sound department said, no way, we, we're not, we're not going to yeah, use this. Yeah. I mean, I've been you know, edited really well, and other times <laughs> you think, well, all the nuances, it's all gone. They, they, they went right to the result. Right. They didn't go through the, what led us to that happening. And, uh, you know, it, it's... I've been in the editing room. I've I've edited uh, other actors and myself too, and it's it's a it's a long arduous process. And uh, and then you're also trying to tell the narrative of yeah. the story, so some things are sacrificed. When did you direct your first film and end up in the editing room? Was uh, that by the Mac was my first film. Mac was in your the first early nineties, yeah. In the in the yeah. did that give you a different sense or yeah. sensitivity? Yes. For yes, it did. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was uh, I was uh, I was. Hard to go back to work. When I went back to work, I felt so bad for the director. Really? Yeah, because I said, oh, my God, he has so much pressure on him. And so I didn't want to bother the director so any at all. Anything that, he, yeah. anything that he had to do? Yeah, was I was no like, okay, moment. I'll do whatever you, you, know, you want. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's, yeah. But you, 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 I mean, you always learn something. You know, you, you, it's you're you're constantly a student in some ways. Did you guys did you guys learn anything new working with like a largely Italian crew in Italy on the Cinecetta uh, stages? Well, you, you you always learn something. I mean, I learned yeah, that there is Italian a, maybe that there is a small army of very talented stage players in the country of Italy, and boy, could they bring it! You know, playing characters, medieval characters, strange mysterious characters it was so great yeah. john uh, i mean i think they're the costume and hair and makeup people are really uh, excellent I'm, in, in addition to the to the actors so uh, i've worked there a bunch of times and i i enjoy you know working there and uh you know they they put a lot of uh, time and care in how someone's hair is cut even if it's a period haircut yeah, they're all different the haircuts yeah. In in the movie, uh, so uh, I I enjoy that. Um, you know, I have to ask. Uh, I, I want to mainly talk about the name of the rose, but I do have to ask, John. You are in the midst of post production, or I think you've already screened it, going places. Right. The, your yeah, it's 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 done now, and I think we're we're gonna we're making a deal for it now. So yeah, it's done. I mean, the world is very excited to see the yeah. the 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 story of Jesus of Quintana. The Jesus, the yeah, story of the Jesus. The story of the Jesus. Yeah, for those that don't know, it's not yeah. necessarily a Big Lebowski sequel, but it is no. the story of the character continues. Yes, yeah, it's a character I actually 
kind of created on stage before I did that movie. And then really? they, they took that idea. Yeah. So I mean, you know, we did all we all permission? have these no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean everybody yeah. takes, you know, or poaches <laughs> from other things. So yeah. So uh, you, I mean uh, I had no idea that that movie would become this uh cult kind of, you know, movie. Uh when I first saw it I I, I had no no clue. Oh, you didn't get it when you first saw it? Not completely, no. <laughs> No, not completely, no. Now I get it. Now I get it. It makes a few watches. I mean, I remember yeah. when I first saw it being kind of like, yeah, okay, this is this is fun. Yeah, yeah. But it's, then it, uh, the jokes pick up more steam the more you see it, I think. You know, I don't know. It is, it's just, <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? I, I bow to the dude. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, he's a great, he's a great actor. He's the type of act actor that we're talking about, Jeff Bridges. You know, he's such a, 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 a generous actor. You know, and really works with the other person. It's a delight to work with. Lots of actors say uh, a generous actor or a great scene partner. And when you say that, are you mainly talking about the fact that they are there and they are present and they are willing to work on the scene with you? That's a that's a large part of it, and and that they're that they're listening or. That's crazy maybe, that that is not <laughs> like the. the but maybe status. it's more intangible well, than that. Maybe maybe it's some kind of magic, if I can use that word, that happens between two musicians, say, or two okay. dancers. Right. Right. Two actors can kind of get on a, a wavelength where you feel right. the buzz of greatness in that moment, for however short it is, and uh, then you know you've done something. Right. You're, you're, there's a harmony sort of created. It's like musicians, you know, but we don't have, I mean, we kind of have the score, but we have to kind of create the music. You know, we, we, it's our internal engines that have to create the music. You know, we have the words, right. but it's, it, it's, it's like a science uh, experiment. It's, it's really, it's hard, you know, we can rely on technique so much, but really it's what happens, you know, in that room. Yeah. I think we have some time for questions from our audience. Who's a question? Right here, hi. Hi, this question mainly is for John, but Michael, certainly feel free to answer as well. John, you've done so many different kinds of roles. This role to a, to a lawyer that still makes me itch when I think about it, and The Night Of, to Herb Stemple on Quiz Show. How difficult is it to change from one character to another because they're so vastly different in their persona, their makeup, their thoughts? I, I refer back to what Michael said. Sometimes it's, it's a pleasure to get, you know, to escape yourself you know, and you can use yourself in imaginary circumstances. And it kind of goes back to being a little kid. You know, when little kids play, they're really deadly serious. You know, they, they put on their cape or whatever. And, uh, you know, it's, there's a craft in it, but then there's also your imagination, your imagination and the, your, the life of being someone else. And that can be, you know, it can be fun, and it can also be arduous sometimes. Uh, uh, but it's nice when you get out of yourself, I think, sometimes. Do you have a character that was, over the course of your career, that you remember as being the hardest to kind of shake? Uh, the longest thing I did was, I, I think this movie I made in, with an Italian director, Francesco Rosi, The Truce. And I was very, it was a, based on a Primo Levi book. It was about his return from Auschwitz home. And I was involved with it for many years. It kept getting postponed, and... And I just love Primo Levi, and I, that was was hard to uh, to come out of that. To take it. It took me a while, uh, physically. It took me a while to because I was so thin for such a long time. So. Michael, do you have a character as well that you found to be really difficult to shake, to let go of? Well, I, I in at the beginning of my TV career, I played a, a serial killer on a TV show called The Practice, and mm. he, he was extra dark. I don't know if anyone ever saw that on the yeah. practice, but it was a scary part. And I watched myself on TV doing it. And I thought, where did, where did all that come from? I felt it was successful, but I, I felt like the tarnish of it stuck to me mm -hmm. for a while. And, and of course, if you do a serial killer well, TV will want you to do it again. So then all your offers after that or all the things you get asked to audition for are, oh are serial murder murderers. So you have to kind of set that aside and say no for a while so that you don't get too pigeonholed. Right. 
That's did, did you find yourself reading like the same type of lines and auditions over and over again? Well, you get you get it. I mean, that happens <laughs> sometimes. Yeah, because people, if you're good at something. People say, "Oh, well, you know, can you do what you did the last time?" Yeah. That's exactly probably what he doesn't want to do. Exactly, because it's never going to be as good again. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you ever feel like that happened to you? Oh, yeah. In your when I when I first started out, you know, people wanted me to play, you know, you know, dark characters. Guy played a few, and it was like, you know, okay, I've done that. So, you know, I was fortunate that other people gave me an opportunity to do something different. Yeah. Uh, one more question. Hi there. Hi. Uh, so I have a question from uh, our website, buildseries.com. Do you have any bad audition stories from the earlier end of your career that might give hope to an early career actor going through a dry spell? Well, there are well, there are always, of course, bad auditions. Yeah. So, so many that, that you can't even name them, and <laughs> some of them you have to walk home and decide whether you can continue to do this. I mean, the, the, you have absurd auditions. Like I was on a table once pretending to be given birth to by an alien. Yeah. So, and that, and, and it was dealt me on the spot. So you think, well, okay, I'm just gonna pull that out of my pocket, but it, it did not. Was it, it wasn't well. in the script for the audition. You were in the audition and they said, hey, why don't you get up on the table and pretend an alien's giving birth they to you? They said, here's another thing we'd like to try with you and we've had <laughs> some success with it. We'd like to try. Like, All right, you, you hear those words. We'd like to try that, yeah. All right, you sadists, let's yeah. see what I can do for you. Yeah, I mean. Hat and run. Yeah. It's, it's, a hard, <laughs> it's a hard process, you know, and, you know, not always, you don't always walk into a room where the people are sensitive to that process. You know, sometimes they're completely uh, insensitive to it. So, uh, yeah, you know, as many times you just go, well, you know, next, you know, you're in the middle of something, you're like, all right, thank you. You know, <laughs> and then you're like, oh my God, you know, and. Uh, Which is so strange, right? Because so many of the people that are in those rooms, that are running those rooms, or even that are making movies or TV, have been around actors for so long, yet they have an antipathy or like they don't necessarily care about the process in any way? Well, some people do and some people don't. You know, they want to see what they want to see right away. And uh, there are good auditioners and sometimes that's it. That's as far as they can go and they get the job sometimes. And there, there are people who are slower in that process. But sometimes, once again, what Michael was saying, to listen to another person, to, 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 to make it a relaxed environment takes effort. And you have to give that out in order for the person to feel comfortable. I think there are a lot of people in power in our industry that work with actors all the time and yet have never really learned to understand them. How, how they might be best motivated, yeah. how they might best be rewarded, how they might be best talked to. Right. Yeah. And everybody's different. Everybody's different. Everybody needs different things, but he's he's right on the money that way. Uh, it's it's kind of surprising. Which forces you as actors to have to bite your tongue more than anything else all the time, I would imagine. Well, you do. I mean, because there's some diplomacy involved, exactly. especially when you want a job. If if something ridiculous is being asked of you, or if you're being slighted in some way, you, you know, you have to find your way through that. And, and try not to leave the entire experience be a smoldering wreckage. <laughs> right. Well, right. I, I, I just find, and I don't just say this because I'm on the stage with two actors, like the acting to be the sort of the hardest job on the set because the camera technician can be like, the camera's broken, I need, I need a minute to fix right. this. And everyone goes, right. oh, okay, that's no problem. And the director can be screaming at people. And everyone's like, well, that's the director. He has to make the movie. Everything's on his shoulders. And they lead on. But the actor steps forward and is like, hey, I need a minute, I'm trying to figure this out. And everyone's like, oh my God, the actor needs a minute. And it's like, that's also a process that requires a certain amount of sensitivity and it gets the least amount, it feels like. Well, it's good if you can do that when there's not a lot of people in the room. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? That's really the key to doing that and then bring the people in the room to, to say, okay, here's what we've arrived at. So uh, there is, you have to make believe you have all the time in the world. You have to, you know, talk yourself into that, even though the light is leaving, the sun is going down, and you only have two minutes to do this scene. You have to somehow think, oh, okay, well, make yourself believe that, oh, yeah, no, I can, 
you know, I have a lot of time to do it. You know, uh, did you guys have a lot of time with the name of the rose? I mean, it's eight episodes. It's eight hours. How long were you? How long were you in Italy shooting? Did you feel like it was shot like an American miniseries is normally shot, or TV show is normally shot, or was there more time? It was more. It was more leisurely. I thought they have what I would say are better work rules in in Europe. They pull the plug at ten hours, and you get a proper lunch break. Mm. So some stuff gets punted to the next day or the next month. But in, in general, I thought it was a, a sensible pace. And because our show is a lot of spectacle and technical issues, you know, it, it sort of sets its own pace. Mm. Right. But I, I thought the scene work, when people were talking, that stuff went by quickly because everybody was really well prepared. There was a few scenes once, you know, sometimes we went back to revisit, you know, if we felt like it, we just didn't crack it. Uh, uh, but I, I think the actors felt like they had enough time. Yeah. Um, it's a beautiful series, guys. Congratulations. Thanks. Incredible work. Uh, thanks for talking about it as well as going deep into the acting process okay. as well with me. <laughs> thanks for having us. Uh, it's going to be on Sundance TV. When is it going to be airing on Thursday Sundance? Thursday at 10 p.m. The first this episode. Thursday, this Thursday. The 23rd. At 10 p.m. Uh, on, uh, on Sundance. Everybody give uh, John and Michael a huge round of applause for being Thank here. Thank you. Thank you.